on the countdown. Three, two, one. Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Awakening Educator. My name is Megan Sweet. And I'm Susan Andrian. And today we are going to be interviewing Dr. Jacqueline Allison, who has done um, some really groundbreaking research into trauma fatigue. And so I'll introduce Jacqueline really briefly, and then we can get into our interview with Jacqueline. I'm so excited that she's here. Uh, and this is part two of our three-part series on trauma. So we started our, our, get our bigger policy, our big picture conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, who talked with us a lot about a model that we use for um, helping kids that are in trauma, and he's really been a groundbreaking leader in bringing trauma-informed practices to schools. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Allison is um, an experienced educator, um, school leader, and now a state leader in the, in the Department of, uh, California Department of Education, and she's done some really groundbreaking research into the impact on teachers of supporting students with so much trauma um, and, are, and teaching in this environment. So um, we'll talk with her about that. And then next week we'll talk with some educators that are working a, with my- A school social worker and an early childhood um, education teacher who are mm -hmm. implementing trauma-informed practices in their work. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so um, Jacqueline Allison is a committed educator with extensive education experience as a teacher and school site, district, and state administrator. Aside from her tenure as a teacher, school principal, and vice principal, she has also supported and or coordinated numerous impactful projects, including the School Conditions Climate Work Group, whose recommendation framework is the impetus for much of the recent work focused on school climate in California and the California State Determined Intervention Model, currently in use by the School Improvement Grant Program recipients. Dr. Allison's work at the California Department of Education includes serving as an education administrator for the Equity Office and supporting the state superintendent's Closing the Achievement Gap Initiative. Recently, Dr. Allison earned her doctorate at the University of Pacific with research interests that encompass compassion fatigue, uh, school site working conditions and climate, the teacher shortage, and teacher retention. She is also an adjunct professor at the University of Pacific, the Gladys L. Bernard School of Education. She lives in Northern California with her husband, three stepchildren, and her dog, Sio, who we have met. And her pronouns are she, her, and hers. Thank you for adding that in, Jacqueline. Um, so excited to have you here. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you, thank you. I just, um, okay, we're recording. I knew that, but I need to let this dog out or he's going to go for it. Yep, okay. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the school climate where it seems like her school climate work led to the compassion fatigue uh, research that she did. So I'm curious. To yeah, I think you should ask for that. Yeah. About it. Yeah. Um, so first, I just want to express my gratitude to you both and to the universe for this opportunity. I promise to make the most of it, and I look forward to our conversation today. And Thanks, I everyone. actually, before we get started, can you talk to me a little bit about your intentionality around um, discussing trauma in this way? I think you've mentioned mm -hmm. like it's a three-parter. Bruce Perry, me, and we have some educators. What was your intention? That's a great question. Do you, you want you want me to do this one? Yeah. All right. So um, we we like to explore all of the topics in this three parter. We we like to start with the big view of policy research, um, and then move into practitioners in the in, in the field and looking at best practices and and um, exemplary programs, and then hear from people that are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. So our focus uh, for all of our topics is to really to provide these multiple lenses into the same topic. And since trauma is where I spend a lot of my work, um, I am the, you know, in, in the mental health, school-based mental health world, and so trauma uh, and the impact of trauma has been significantly important. Yeah, so Susan, um that's right. We often don't introduce our roles or our kind of our yeah, where we come no, from we often anymore. Right? Yeah, that's a, so it's a good question. So Susan's uh, work in schools is in school mental health. So she works with kids that are in trauma mm -hmm. and supports communities and staff uh, to work with kids, especially when they're in crisis. Yeah. 
And as you know, from our past experience, so Jacqueline and I met um, when I was uh, working with the state on determining the statewide model, I was doing a little bit of consulting. Um, I am on the other side of the house. So I focus on the operational and instructional sides of schools. So, yeah. yeah. So when we came together and really thought about how we want to look at all of these issues that we explore, it's really to take these lens of what's happening in the big picture, what's happening in, in best practices and exemplary programs, and then what day-to-day -day impact of this work. Um, and, I, and compassion fatigue and, and self-care is really also a big chunk of the work that I do with schools right now. Yeah, yeah. So okay. thanks for asking that question. Yeah. So yeah. maybe you could, go that ahead. That helps me. So oh, that, yeah, that helps me know how to approach our conversation today. I really Great. appreciate that. Oh, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background, and um, so you've na we've named that you're a teacher and a school leader. But I'm I'm wondering how you got to be curious about uh, studying compassion fatigue, and you know where that began. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, I think it really just stems from personal experience. I was um, so I taught for like eight years, and then I moved into administration. But I've always wanted to work in schools um, with kids who look like me, you know, high poverty, who have needs that, um, you know, need extra attention so that they can thrive. And I love that. But then when I was engaging in that work, um, well, a couple of things were happening. I had a lot of students who were going through some tremendous, you know, traumatic experiences. And it was happening often, like all of the time. And then in my personal life at the same time, I was going through some experiences uh, in terms of trauma and remembering things. And the kids' trauma triggered me. And um, eventually, I ended up with a full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. And while I was taking time off to heal, um, I came across the term compassion fatigue. And I just started reading, like, I'm gonna, I have some here. So like, some of the symptoms were anxiety, depression, sadness, you know, not being able to turn off your mind and thinking about what your students were going through or feeling like helpless. And I'm like, it started to resonate with me, like, oh my God, I think, I think this is what's happening with me. And at the same time, I could actually see my husband, who's also an educator, um, kind of experiencing the same thing. And so I just started to ask, I'm like, you know, I started talking with people, um, does this resonate with you? And every teacher that I talked with, every administrator that I talked with, every educator that I talked with, um, was like, yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. Mm. And I was, so I was in the, getting my doctorate and I didn't see a whole lot of compassion fatigue research being talked about in the context of teachers. Mm. And I thought, you know, we should. Maybe we should have that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think um, the other thing that was really interesting about this, uh, getting kind of interested in this topic, was at the same time I was coordinating or supporting the school conditions and climate work group. Mm -hmm. And in the school climate work, we kept talking about how climate and conditions aren't just for students, right? You want a positive school climate for kids. We know that you know, not everyone has the same experience, even in the same school. Everyone's got a different experience. But the same is true for teachers. And when we have a positive climate and positive working conditions, it supports teacher retention, right? And people are happy and they want to stay at the job. And when I was looking at the compassion fatigue and teacher retention and understanding that we have this huge teacher shortage, I kept thinking to myself, well, what would drive someone um, beyond just the school climate piece, but what would drive someone whose passion is to work in a school setting like that, a high poverty school, away? And so as I started asking those questions, um, the way I just described that story, it just became more and more apparent that there was a connection between yeah. school climate, working conditions, teacher retention, and compassion fatigue. Yeah, that's, that's, um, it's such a powerful way of connecting the pieces together and I appreciate you naming your personal experiences and how those started showing up mm -hmm. and um, nowadays you're I'm sure you know this but you're not alone honestly with the amount of mm -hmm. um, 
pressure that the that adults are under in mm -hmm. schools, this is showing up a lot. And, and mm -hmm. I see it a lot actually in the mindfulness world. So there's lots of different ways you can kind of go about this. But I work it with an organization that brings mindfulness to schools. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, I'm trying to get to the same issue, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, if the adults are dysregulated, um, mm -hmm. they're gonna make it hard for the kids and right. they're gonna shut down the kids' learning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they're responding to the stressors that the kids are bringing into the school. Mm -hmm. And we can't seem to like even calm down enough to be able yeah. to like uh -huh. uh, yeah. really be still. Um, so I really appreciate your work there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. can you just define for us what compassion fatigue is or how you define it. Um, I know you named a couple of examples of, of um, um, PTSD. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think of it as the physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion that comes with working with people who are in constant states of distress or trauma. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was actually doing the research, Charles Higley, one of the researchers around this work, described it as the cost for caring. In the sense that people you care for, you take care of, eventually it takes a toll on you. And so, you know, that's how I kind of define it. And just even saying physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion, I think people get that. They're like, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to say, you know, when you're talking about how you're looking at um, supporting teachers and you're going about it in different ways, with mindfulness or, or passion fatigue or self-care or whatever it may be. I agree that if we want to have healthy, happy kiddos, we need healthy, happy, whole adults as they set the space. And kids are growing up in that kind of energy or learning in an energy that's not healthy, it's not going to be good for kids or the teachers. So yeah, yeah that's important to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm curious because I, I, I also 100% agree and I feel like <laughs> <laughs> the part of the challenge and you, you talk about in your in your dissertation about the flaws in the system mm -hmm. to support the structure mm -hmm. itself having flaws and and mm -hmm. I really feel that as well trying to do this work and move this work forward that the system itself doesn't really mm -hmm. you have to wedge in there somehow mm -hmm. but it's not yeah. really set up to support people to be able to take care of themselves or or, mm -hmm. or self-care and then how that that cycle just sort of plays on itself and mm -hmm. then the satisfaction of the work mm -hmm. becomes harder and harder and just sort of curious about what you have in mind around this, this, the flaws and what we might be able to do to shift some of those flaws. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's interesting. It, as much as teachers are a pivotal and vital part of education, I don't think the system really sees teachers, not completely, right? The, the rhetoric that you hear, and even now, I think they're, we just had a, some item up here before the state board and we were looking at definitions for inexperienced teachers or ineffective teachers or, you know, how to build teachers. I don't think we see teachers' needs. And when I was looking at this from a policy perspective, oftentimes um, when we create policy at the state level, I think um, we don't always have enough of a conversation with the stakeholders who actually act, have to implement those policies. Mm -hmm. So if we're creating, I mean, I know that there are times where we engage, but I think to make effective policy, especially around teacher support and self-care in the system, we have to do a lot more talking with teachers, mm -hmm. get a much better understanding. And actually, I just want to applaud there. I do think that this research applies to all educators, but I specifically study teachers, so I'm gonna use that term for now. Mm -hmm. But um, so in terms of that, I think there needs to be some sort of communication loop, right? I can recall in my credentialing program and even when I was teaching, I never once heard about what the state board was doing and how the state board of education or the department of ed or uh, legislators affected my every work, um, every daily, everyday work environment. And I think that we need to train people to understand that so we can get a little bit more involved. And I also, I don't know, I'm just going to, it's a pie in the sky idea, but I would really love it if those who are making policy, if they've not been an educator before, actually spent some time in the classroom <laughs> actually having to do it on their own. 
That sounds revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> now people so making cool. decisions actually go in the classroom. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it's mind blowing really that, that that's true. And what yeah. you're naming is absolutely, absolutely right. That A, you know, there's actually a ton of research that shows that teachers mm -hmm. are one of the most important determining factors of a child's success. And if you're mm -hmm. in a good teacher's classroom, kids can mm -hmm. advance two or three grade levels or they can go backwards. Mm -hmm. At yeah. grade levels, right? Just just mm -hmm. by that interaction and mm -hmm. multiple exposure to bad teachers makes kids a really behind academically, but also dis disillusions them or just you know they're not attached mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. um, if that happens, and yet it's a profession that is um, so underfunded, so un not mm -hmm. understood. Mm -hmm. um, policymakers have very rarely been educators themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Or it's been a million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. um, <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I worked at the, the CDE on a project around education finance, which is a little bit different in that you don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be educators, I suppose, to worry about the finance part. Mm -hmm. But um, none, of, none of the people I'd work with, mm -hmm. and I can't speak from the CDE side, but from the, mm -hmm. from the group that I was consulting with, almost none of them had ever been in a school. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and to your point, actually, as we were mm -hmm. doing the work, I kept urging us to speak to actual practitioners in schools mm -hmm. as we were imagining rolling out this mm -hmm. thing we were rolling out, which I'll keep right. somewhat vague. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and that was like, I was laughed out of the room. <laughs> when wow. I was like, you know what we should do? Before we roll this out, we should actually <laughs> talk to some principals and some mm -hmm. superintendents and mm -hmm. really get a sense of this is reasonable. Yeah. And, um, and we don't do that. So you're right, just basic communication is absolutely mm -hmm. missing in a lot mm -hmm. of our work. And support of the most basic unit in a kid's success academically. Yes. We under underfund, we stick kids in there that have just graduated from college or have no mm -hmm. experience whatsoever with our highest mm -hmm. need students. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You know, I um, just hearing you think about that. I just keep thinking you're absolutely right. Teachers are the most important unit. And when you think about any type of reform that we want to incorporate or, um, Put in place or maybe you don't want to use the term reform but if we're talking about making mindful classrooms then you have to have mindful teachers right mm -hmm. and if we're talking about implementing social emotional learning or restorative justice practices or any of those things they all flow through the teacher Absolutely. and so i really honestly like i uh i think in my uh, research i said this and i'm going to say it again this research is from my love letter to teachers i don't think i would have been as successful as I feel that I am, or and when I say successful, I don't, I'm not talking about career-wise, just healthy and whole and you know relatively happy life without those teachers. And mm -hmm. I see that a lot of kids don't have really great teachers right now, or in their substitutes, or they're missing out on education, and it breaks my heart. So whatever we can do to support those adults in the room so that they can stay, so that kids can thrive. I'm all for it. Yeah. So what are, yeah. what are some ways you can do that then? So if we know, so what are some symptoms that you're experiencing trauma fatigue? Maybe that's a starting point. We talked about it a little bit, but then once you realize that that's what's going on, what can you start to do to get better? Mm. You know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the symbol behind you. You have a light bulb yeah. there, the awakening <laughs> educator. Uh, awareness is half the battle. Mm. Actually, I think that what I found in the research and even talking to people now, that when you don't have a name for it, when you don't know exactly what is mm -hmm. happening, you tend to um, withdraw, you don't talk about it, and so you're not actually seeking the support that you need. Yeah. But when you have an understanding that this is a possibility, this is something that could you know, happen, or is, you know, it's a symptom of working with students or people who are experiencing a lot of trauma, um, it just, I don't know, it just like people would say, wow, now I have a name for it. Now I know what I'm looking at. Now I, I can seek help or support. And when I, when I say help or support, I'm thinking about like, talking to others about what you're going through, not um, you know, maybe strengthening and supporting each other around what's happening. And then when I say each other, I'm thinking teachers, adults in the school. Some people seek therapy. Some people, um, I've seen, you know, a lot of the practices I think you talk about in your book you know, around self-care and journaling or exercising or whatever you need to do to make yourself 
feel healthier and whole so that when you come back to school the next day or next week that you feel recharged and rejuvenated. I think those are things that you could do. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. One, of, one of the things that uh, in the training and work that I do with teachers that is very similar to what you were just talking about is creating mm -hmm. a plan that a self-care plan that includes mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of things we think about of self-care, like if we're running and swimming mm -hmm. and, and seeing friends, but also what do you do in the moment when mm -hmm. you're feeling the stress? Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're in the classroom and you can't mm -hmm. really employ all mm -hmm. those things? What's your plan? Yeah for that mm -hmm. moment and mm -hmm. then what's your meaning making plan when you know you're mm -hmm. totally stressed out and things didn't go mm -hmm. really well what can you do then mm -hmm. sort of thinking about what you're talking about the 30 percent of it seems to oh, a big chunk of it seems to be i'm aware mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. i'm not my best self i have right. definitely not been my best self mm -hmm. so how do you how do you judge mm -hmm. it so i appreciate thinking about it in that term and i love the light that you brought in the light bulb because mm -hmm. yeah it is awareness Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing you you brought up that I think is helpful. So I think awareness is is actually for someone like me that's like more than half the battle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're also really disconnected from our our hearts and our bodies, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's what I I talk a lot about. I appreciate you naming my book. I, I talk a lot about that in the book of like really it's becoming aware and learning mm -hmm. how to start to see yourself with more clarity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that when those moments happen, you're aware of the pattern that's playing out. You're aware mm -hmm. of your emotional mm -hmm. um, state of mind, <laughs> mm -hmm. state of body, and you and you can figure out some way to address it right in that moment, which mm -hmm. often we lose, right? Like we're so mm -hmm. reactive that we're mm -hmm. off to the races before, you know, we can stop that thing, saying the thing we say mm -hmm. or the way that we judge our kids mm -hmm. or judge ourselves. And it's already done before we get there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think catching that. And the other thing that you said that I really appreciate that I, I think we really need to do a lot more of is, mm -hmm. is opening up the conversation and naming it's mm -hmm. true. Um, mm -hmm. I heard something, um, I'm, still, I'm still mad at it, like a year and a half later. It wow. really bugged me. And actually, <laughs> okay. It was hearsay. I wasn't even oh, there. Oh I just God. heard something okay. happen and I'm on. still <laughs> mad about it. Um, mm -hmm. But in a school district where I used to work, um, mm -hmm. uh, they started the school year by interviewing principals and asking them, um, like, what are you, what's your strategy for bringing in high quality teachers? That was the, the thing. Mm -hmm. That was the conversation that they were having. Mm -hmm. And a principal who... Um, is an effective principal, um, like she, she brings good results to her school. Um, she definitely came into a school that has a lot of strong structures in place as well, but she's doing a really good job maintaining all of those. Um, mm -hmm. And she's kind of seen as a principal with a lot of power and prestige. We're, we're in a place where there's a tin roof. I don't know if you can hear the rain. Yeah, here. it's raining here. Yeah. Um, we're happy for the rain here, but <laughs> it is yeah. sound quality. It's a late rain. Um, anyway, so they were asking her, and mm -hmm. she said that... Um, a red flag when she's interviewing teachers is if they name if that they have a self-care routine and if they have a self-care routine she oh instantly God. doesn't hire them and the response in the room what? i know <laughs> the response in the room was like, was like applause so really? then all huh? the principals in the room applauded like yeah and um see i'm mad about it oh my <laughs> God. did they give a reason for that I mean, um, you know, thinking yeah, with my administrator hat, I could think of some reasons why she would say that, but what did she say? I think it's the fear that they're going to then not, I mean, and I, and I have my administrator hat on too, right? So mm -hmm. I can say like, okay, there are those mm -hmm. teachers that book it out of there the mm -hmm. second the kids are out and they're yeah. not engaged in school mm -hmm. and they're very unmovable when mm -hmm. you have to like move a meeting around or you want to spend mm -hmm. some extra time planning, right? Like I can imagine like the worst case scenario of mm -hmm. a teacher who's like very rigid. But oh. the teachers generally, in my experience, the rigid teachers are, are the teachers that really don't have a good self-care. Yeah, they're sure. The ones that are what we're talking about, compassion fatigue or burnout, where they're, mm -hmm. where they're feeling so resentful and so mm -hmm. attacked. But well, they got nothing left exhausted. Well, oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I know. <laughs> I actually I'm with was, you. Yeah. From a different perspective, I was thinking that maybe she was thinking that those teachers may not have the emotional strength or support uh, that they need 
to actually handle a classroom, right? That's what yeah. I was thinking. Like maybe that's one reason. And you're right. Uh, I mean, you're, I really, don't... you're a loving administrator. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what it is? It, it's because it's interesting because when I did this research, it made me look at teachers with more compassionate eyes, and that's important because. Yeah. Um, when I define compassion, you know, it's you definitely have empathy. You can you can see someone suffering. You can put yourself in their shoes, but you also take that step to go beyond it and try to ease or end the suffering if you can. And what I'm starting to realize, you, you were just talking about, actually, the teachers who don't have self care plans are the ones who leave, right? You know, I had people like that that I've interviewed, and. Prior to getting to that point, they were the ones who were most engaged, right? And, you know, right. volunteering for everything. But when your well is not replenished, it's super tired and you can't keep that up. And so when I hear an administrator talking about that, maybe that administrator also has um, some emptiness in the well that needs to be replenished as well because they don't have the time or the energy to kind of deal with teachers who might need a little bit more support. And it's okay. I mean, there's yeah. like nothing wrong with that. But I think, I think, you know, people have this notion that, you know, you're supposed to be able to be perfect and really great right at the beginning. And it's just not true. It's not the case. Right? Well, I agree with you too, because I, I think that's where um, we need to have our administrators. It's so funny. I think we need to talk so directly loud into the mic right now because our readers, though, it's a great, great start. Very loud. It's, it would All be right. really romantic oh, and I lovely <laughs> at any other time than I this know. one. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think administrators really need that support because mm -hmm. they are struggling and, mm -hmm. um, and they hold the keys to teacher success. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's a two-parter. This mm -hmm. administrator... Um, I love your your thought that maybe she just realized those people don't um, don't have those assets. That's not how it was relayed to me, but you're right, I wasn't there. So I can give mm -hmm. a hearsay hope that yeah. maybe it was that they realized that these folks needed a self care space. Well, mm -hmm. it but makes I, me think of like yeah. the, the therapy I did when with the stigma attached mm -hmm. with taking care of yourself, the stigma mm -hmm. attached with mm -hmm. having to do something. And that part mm -hmm. of it comes back to what you were talking about before of elevating the conversation and making it it should be part of teacher training program. Mm -hmm. It should be part of administrative training program. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the other side of the coin is that we're we're kind of trained to really overwork, right? Yeah. So we're dedicated mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and we um, that we have more work than we can get to through in a day. Any yeah. one mm -hmm. of us, you know, they're mm -hmm. not jobs that you put down at the end of the day and go home mm -hmm. and do whatever. Mm -hmm. And administrators tend to be the more extreme version of a highly successful teacher, right? Yeah. Well, teachers mm -hmm. become administrators, and mm -hmm. so they repeat the pattern yep. mm -hmm. of, of self-harm, really, by mm -hmm. overworking, yep. by right. overextending themselves, and then they only want to be around other people that will do that, because that kind of reinforces, they've been trained mm -hmm. that that's what a good educator does, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. A good educator works extremely hard, mm -hmm. um, is selfless, yep. right? And it gets back to your point around the structure in the mm -hmm. first place, yeah. not really being set up, because mm -hmm. the job is kind of impossible and you can either write your lesson plan and have a good day the next day or turn off work and be mm -hmm. with your family and yeah and I think I think the interesting thing is that there's space and room for all of that but I think when I said that we don't see teachers our system doesn't really see that I don't think that we think of teachers as human like you, you can't go above and beyond all of the time and still remain effective whether you're an administrator, a counselor, a teacher, or whatever, even a parent, right? Everyone has to take some time to recharge. And in the research, I found that with social workers, for example, or with uh, first responders like, you know, policemen or you know, nurses, they recognize that, hey, wait a second, all of that work, all of that overwork was taking its toll. We need to step back here and talk a little bit about what's happening Let's provide some self-care strategies. Let's support them. Let's give them what they need so that they can be more effective at their work. Why aren't we doing that for teachers? We need to do that for teachers as well. Yeah, I mean, it's important. Mm -hmm. It's important. We have to do that. And I just talked about that. And it's not a plug, but it is. I just talked about that in the TEDx talk about how teachers are first responders too. And if we train them as such, I think we would have a much better and healthier and I, I would even say healing school system 
and oh, I love that. Yeah, I'm just hoping that you know people will understand that and they get that. I was just thinking about um, Saugus High, right? We just had yeah. the school shooting there, right? And you had, I think, in the parking lot once someone's parent was an off-duty police officer, so you had someone who was there, and maybe had a security guard or two, but who really was dealing with all of those kids at that moment? Come on, who was it? Right? Right, right, right. All of those educators on that campus, every one of them is a first responder and they need to be trained as such. Otherwise, I feel like we are, um, it's unethical behavior on our part from the school system to let that continue. Right. Honestly, it's immoral, um, in my opinion there. Can you oh, tell a little bit more about what being uh, training the teachers as a first responder would in, what involves? Well, I mean, I would think, I would think that, I mean, we would have to have a better understanding of what it means to work with someone who's experiencing trauma or is in crisis. I'm not saying you would be a counselor or, or, or that, that maybe that's not your role, but you have enough understanding to recognize signs of distress in students. So maybe uh, mental health first aid training. I would think yeah. that, um, I know that as a state, we provide it, but not for everyone. You know, it's not, we don't have enough funding so that everyone can be trained. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of funding for other things, but that's another story, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, so I think about that. I, I know that people have emergency claims and things that they might do. They have these drills and things like that. But what if, um, I don't know, what if you had... Uh, people on staff who were actually trained to do, to like take charge and be, you know, beyond just the administrator. Maybe we have more teachers and more people who are trained to um, kind of go into, I'm sorry, I'm struggling for the word, but China. But I'm thinking about it, like they're able to respond effectively. They've been trained to actually, this is what we're gonna do when this happens, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was hoping, and I'm hoping still, that um, as a state, that we have teams like that, that are deployed statewide, that we have in the county, that we have in the school districts, because trauma, traumatic experiences keep happening. And unfortunately, in California right now, there are such large scale um, traumatic yeah. experiences, the fires and, you know. So that so, is yeah. my job in the <laughs> district that I'm in, is the thing that we were just talking about. and and. Um, and there's not enough of us. There's not, mm -hmm. a, there's not enough of us by any means, but mm -hmm. the support and what I, what's been expressed to me, what you were just talking about, which I think is so incredibly mm -hmm. important is the relief of the principal to have somebody who can come and stand mm -hmm. next to them and partner with them mm -hmm. who's been through crisis, like, you know, mm -hmm. who knows how to organize mm -hmm. the grief or organize the needs or contact mm -hmm. the family or support. Here's our steps. One, two, three, here's yeah. your tips here. And then which classrooms do we want to support the teachers and which ones want to hold it? And mm -hmm. so I, I really feel like every school and every district should have a plan like that. And then I love your idea of having everybody trained in first aid mental health, because mm -hmm. to me, the, the drills that, that we do around first, you know, around um, shooter drills, those are not as important as mm -hmm. the mental health first aid training that teachers mm -hmm. need to have. Yeah. 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 It made me think of, um, so I have been listening to uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's book, uh, <laughs> The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And, mm -hmm. and, and to your point, Jacqueline, he talks about all these missed opportunities of mm -hmm. educators who don't mm -hmm. understand what's happening with the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kids that are getting misunderstood and then mm -hmm. categorized. And, and I, it's a, I love educators, but my personal pet peeve is how quickly teachers and others will start to like diagnose children with no training to do yeah. it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that kid needs me like how many like that. They're bipolar, <laughs> 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 right? Let's give, him, let's give them meds. Like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you're not trained for that. So, um, mm -hmm. but I think being trained to understand the signs is really important, mm -hmm. um, and to ask questions. And one mm -hmm. of the main things he does, and you talked about it too, is is actually have a dialogue with families mm -hmm. where you're not coming in and you're telling them what's wrong with your child, but you're getting curious about mm -hmm. the child's story and the parent's story, and you're trained mm -hmm. then to listen to a few cues that can help you to then refer them appropriately exactly. or support them appropriately. I mean, I, mm -hmm. his book is heartbreaking for me anyway. on so many levels. And I'm, I, my, you know, mm -hmm. my, uh, utmost respect for him for wading into this work that I couldn't handle myself. 
Mm -hmm. But the, this missed opportunity that's there is, um, yeah, it's terribly heartbreaking for me. And, and that's an extreme case. But I think, again, mm -hmm. you know, if we, and I don't know if this fits into your category or not, but so we can imagine, like, we can start to identify kids that are showing some signs of trauma that are important. Mm -hmm. And I would love to add to that first responder training, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some training on implicit bias and yeah. on other ways mm -hmm. that we're causing harm to kids. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how that fits into your SAL picture, what you're doing at the state level. Well, I mean, I, in the in my research, I talk about implicit bias, and at the state level right now, there's much more focus on it and an understanding that we actually need to talk about it, to tackle it, to train, to help people understand. I mean, dialogue for me, talking about something, meaning something, I think for me, it's very important. Because once you do that, you're able to say, oh, this is what it is. Now I can think of ways to um, address it or to deal with it. In my research, what I was talking about in terms of the stress level, you have kids who are stressed out, right? They're, they're in trauma, so fight or flight responses. And then you have teachers who are also stressed out, right? Mm -hmm. They're in fight or flight. And um, they're stuck in a classroom. Nobody's fleeing. So they're just triggering each other back and forth. And then at the same time, when we talk about race and we add bias and issues that are maybe not even just race, but like abilities or gender or, or sexual orientation or whatever that might be, it also is very stressful. You yeah. just basically yeah. too stressed to think about it. And I think that my mom used to say, uh, it's a scripture too, but out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. When you are super stressed and you don't have the energy to kind of have your filter or to be politically correct, whatever's in there, even mm -hmm. if it's biased, that's mm -hmm. what comes out. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see that statewide in terms of discipline um, numbers, suspension rates, who's getting suspended, who's being referred for special education when they may not have that, you know, or, or who's getting, uh, even my, I think, I'm going to say that who gets grace? Yeah, right. absolutely. It gets the yeah. best. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Well, and to me, this goes back to this developing this relationship with yourself that you were talking about so that mm -hmm. you can have the confidence. And, and maybe this is just from my point of view. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's so hard to even face ourselves. And we're in so, like, we're so much denial about who we are, how we're showing up, or what's there. We don't want to see. Um, we don't want to acknowledge that we have biases. Um, mm -hmm. And if we don't make that normal, mm -hmm. just like if we don't normalize talking about stress or anything else, mm -hmm. then it becomes this thing that's in the shadows, even to ourselves. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then we can't talk about it. And mm -hmm. then we're just continuing to harm kids in private, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what I and say? Adults, I, was, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was struck by your the data that you had around um, race and the compassion fatigue and that even when you take into consideration socioeconomic status, that mm -hmm. the compassion fatigue was higher among educators of students of color than of white students, even when there wasn't an economic issue. Yeah. And I was really mm -hmm. struck by that data and, and, yeah. and yeah, um, it, you know, the I was, It struck me too, actually, that I found it to be heartbreaking the first time I, uh, you know, was running the numbers and did it repeatedly, I just kept testing and I was getting a double check to support. And, Basically, um, you know, when I defined compassion fatigue earlier, I didn't talk about how I measured it. And I used a professional quality of life scale that was um, developed by Charles Bigley, but now is attributed to Barbara Stam. And she calls, or she measures compassion fatigue in two parts. So it's burnout and secondary trauma. Mm. And so um, if, as the percentage of African-American students um, increases in a school, um, so do the secondary traumatic stress scores, which tells me, number one, that you have African-American students who are experiencing a lot of trauma firsthand, because if teachers are experiencing secondhand trauma, that means they're, getting, they're working with the kids there. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, when we're talking about burnout, and stressed and overworked, and you know, just all, you know, had it up to here, effective filter stuff, all of that, if you have a group of students who is experiencing a ton of trauma, when they express it, it's not always beautiful. It's not mm, pretty. Right, right. And um, when I just said earlier, whatever's the most in there, you're just trying to control the situation. And I think you just do what you do. And I, uh, unfortunately, a lot of kids get, you know, kicked out or because the person in the room hasn't been supported enough 
to say, wait a second, <laughs> I'm, you know, I need to check in here. How am I feeling? I, I mean, I really loved what you were talking about in your book, but, you know, being able to check in and say, okay, let me stop. Let me calm myself down here. And how might I do this differently? How might I handle this differently? And what I was going to say was, whatever I, whenever I talk to people about this or educators and they're telling me their story, the first thing I always tell them is, it's okay. Mm. It's okay. Mm. Mm. Right? Because people, I, I'm, I don't want to cry. I always want to cry with my because I think people feel so bad about having these feelings, right? Mm. And feeling like, um, you know, either stressed or having feelings that may not be necessarily positive and they hide it. And we mm. have to have to talk about it. Even in my own journey on um, the PTSD, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, being able to breathe and sit and know that whatever you're feeling, it's okay. And now that we know it, how do we address it? Yeah. 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 I had the great opportunity to um, work with uh, a researcher. Who, I talk about her in my book, but I don't know if you've run across Kristen Neff's work, but she, um, she studies self-compassion. And I think that's mm -hmm. that part that you're talking about, which is how do you start to learn to relate to yourself with some care and some mm -hmm. compassion? Um, mm -hmm just as what you said, like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like you said that and I got like shivers. So I was like, mm -hmm. right, like that, it's as simple as that of just being seen and being allowed to feel what you're mm -hmm. feeling and mm -hmm. being supported in that. Like how often, we almost never give that to our educators. Never. Ever. Yeah. 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 Think about it, California has over 300,000 teachers who serve mm -hmm. 6.2 million kids. If mm -hmm. every one of them was supported and knew that we see them, that it's okay and that we're gonna give you whatever you need to feel better, to feel healthy and whole. What would that do for California? What would do that do for the kids? And then in the country, you have over 3 million teachers. I mean, oh my God, that would yeah, just yeah. be systemically, like, everything would change. It would just- And it costs nothing. It doesn't help. cost anything. I know. Nobody, <laughs> it's, just, it's just kindness. It's just <laughs> kindness. Yeah. So, you briefly mentioned, and I want to call it out. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't even, I don't even think you said the name, so I, I want to say it. <laughs> okay. um, so Jacqueline just did a TED Talk. It was pretty great TED Talk. I really enjoyed it. I really so enjoyed it. tell us about that. What was that like? And, mm, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, we'll we'll put a link to it in on the website. But I would love to hear you talk about your TED Talk. Yeah, it's a, well, TEDx, so I want to make sure you add the X there. <laughs> but um, basically, my, the title is called um, Compassion Fatigue. Teachers are suffering, and it impacts all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was writing it, so, sorry, so in the, in the TED Talk, I talk about my journey to get to the TED Talk and how I just went through surgery and I almost died, and like I got sepsis, and when I was trying, at the same time all of that was happening, I found out that I was actually accepted to mm. be a part of this TED Talk. And I had to sit down and try to write. But all of my energy was going towards healing. And I had this, I don't know, just foggy like brain. And I actually was kind of nervous. I don't know why I'm telling you all this, but I'm telling you this. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because in order to write that TED Talk, I really had to tap into more of who I was. You know, you've got your intellect, you've got all of that, but I actually had to say a lot of prayer, do a lot of meditation and sit down and say, okay, what is it that I need to say? Because I wasn't able to think as clearly as I needed to at that time. And what kept coming to me was this idea that um, if we don't really see teachers, if we don't, if we don't, um, to give them the support that they need to be um, to to help kids. Um, what would what would that be like? And then I started to think about well, who do we support? Who helps us the most? And who do we give support to? And who do we love and adore as a country? And it's first responders. And um, eventually, um, what came out was this idea that if teachers are first responders too, and if we supported them as such we could facilitate healing for our entire country and for the state. And I think the TED, TED Talk is great. 
um, it's been um, pretty well received. Um, and everything in there was just straight from my heart. It was um, when I talked about my research, but what I'm really telling you again, and I said this earlier, this was my love letter to mm -hmm. educators. I want people to see us so that we have strong, healthy, whole educators so that we can have strong, healthy, whole kids. It's important. You have to do that. So yeah, mm -hmm. hope you check it out. Really cool. Oh, for sure. I was so heartbroken. I couldn't be there in person. I told you I was trying to be there in person. <laughs> yeah. and the same day that my whole team was flying in from across the country. Uh, and I couldn't <laughs> um, well, it, it's really, it's, it, it's, it's very heartfelt. And I yeah. think it, you, you're the genuineness of your experience and the authenticity really comes through. So I, I think that that's such an important piece of this is that we're connecting in these real and authentic ways and that it's hard for all of us and if we're not acknowledging that it's hard for all of us, even the, the principal is struggling. We're mm -hmm. all, we all have to show up and, and care for mm -hmm. each other in this co and creating systems that have co-care embedded right in it rather than mm -hmm. um, people that have to take care of themselves are the ones that you're not, not that you're avoiding. <laughs> that you're avoiding. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a, yeah, you are, you're incredibly genuine and, um, and I think that grounding that you have, it just comes through. And I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. surprised you came up with something so brilliant in that space because you also <laughs> had the, the presence of mind to recognize what was going on mm -hmm. and that you couldn't yeah. do what you wanted to do. And mm -hmm. you dropped in and you looked <laughs> yeah. for guidance. And that's, I think that's how that works. Um, yeah. So that's really inspiring for me. I'm feeling pretty burnt out myself right now. Cool. So just even hearing that <laughs> gives me a lot of hope. Um, so I've been like, having heart palpitations and not, I mean, I'm doing, I know better and I'm doing all the stuff, right? Cause that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that myself right now. So it's inspiring for me. Yeah. Megan? It's yes. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> I know I'm serious. It's okay. No, I know. I love you, Jacqueline. You're so wonderful. <laughs> love you too. Love you too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I was, um, I guess I should tell you, I am moving on from the CME. You I'm are. Out. What are you doing? Yes. What's your next venture? My next venture will be um, program coordinator for the California Teacher Residency Lab. <gasps> oh, wow. A couple of years ago, California gave uh, $75 million for us to try teacher residency. And they've given out the grants. And... You know, it's a partnership between a school district and an institute of higher ed. So, like, you, uh -huh. know, you know, so maybe like Elk Grove and UOP or something like that. Not, uh -huh. They're not one of them, but they are training teachers or student teachers are getting their credential. And at the same time, they're training alongside a seasoned teacher for a That's year. That's great. Mm. Right? And they're training them while they're doing it. And then so that they'll be ready day one when they start their job to be able to deal and handle that classroom. And at the same time, what I love about it is that um, they also have a job when they do. You know, they get to commit to working in the district for a few years, but isn't that a great way to address the shortage? Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and my role to... is uh, yeah. around professional learning and creating that network. So, so you can help to bring your work forward too. Which yeah. is what a great place yeah. to do the work because um, so I met Jacqueline at the state, which like, you know, it's a bureaucracy on top of a bureaucracy on top mm -hmm. of a bureaucracy on top of a bureaucracy mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. put another one on top of that just right. for fun. And so <laughs> like to be, actually be able to impact teachers and students, it's, it's, it, it's mm -hmm. possible. And I know you've done really important work there, but it takes like a... Mm -hmm sheer will yeah. <laughs> and an incredible amount of perseverance to just keep going because you'll mm -hmm. hit a lot of roadblocks along the you way do. Do. and um and there's a little bit of like squirreliness understandably mm -hmm. at any kind of state level or anything like mm -hmm. that around trying something different so what a great training mm -hmm. ground yeah. testing place for some of your ideas because you'll be able mm -hmm. to directly impact and see are you going to do some research on it too? Or are you going to like do some like research on it? It's the you know, coolest thing about this. That's the goal. I mean, it's yeah. one of my, the biggest attractions to this job for me was the system level. You know, you're yeah. working mm -hmm. with the credential program <laughs> and the school district at that level. I'm like, really, God, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. Let me try this. 
Because yeah, and you have a university there. I felt like growing up, that's how teachers learned. And then that went away. Like, I felt like there were always student teachers coming through and working along seasoned teachers. And I feel like that it, that part of this shortage, we just threw people right into the classroom. But now we have even less because they're not mm -hmm. really prepared to be there. So I'm so grateful you're doing that work because I feel like that's that really is such a key, the apprenticeship, the opportunity mm -hmm. to grab. Yeah. 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 yeah, I guess I guess I had it when I was when I was teaching. I mean, I was in the classroom from the first day on my own because I wanted it to be that way. Uh, <laughs> shocking. Shocker, Megan. At twenty two, I felt like I could handle those eighteen year olds by myself, and I did. And you did. I, they tried to date me, but it was because <laughs> yeah. I looked like I was a peer. Yeah. Um, but I did have people to talk to and right. I had master teachers that were there and that would come mm -hmm. in and I did some really big knucklehead things that first year teachers <laughs> do yes. and they were there to catch me right. and to mm -hmm. talk it through with me yeah. and to give me their insights and that's oh. really powerful. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, there we go. You're back. Yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's brilliant. I I could talk to you for like another hour, and we're already at our time. I just want to know that the ProQual is available online for free, and I encourage if you yeah. are an educator and you're really wanting to check your own um, mm -hmm. where you are in burnout and compassion fatigue, we'll, we can put the link on our page. Okay. Well. Yeah. But yeah. I encourage yeah. folks to do that. It's super helpful and insightful. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, it's such a thrill. Thanks, to, I, I always just love talking to you. I love yeah. talking to you too. Thank it you. It was again. great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And do let us know how you're doing. I'll, um, I'll talk yeah. to you offline oh, maybe. I told but I'm, you. I told maybe. you. Friends for life. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> I know. We keep finding each other. It's, uh, yeah, we're bonded forever. <laughs> yeah. And maybe when we do our series on teacher training, we'll have you That's back. That's right. Have you back for a while. Right. Let's talk about maybe coming in and talking with the, with the teacher residency, you know, people around. I your, would love that. Around mindfulness, around awakening. So, that would be yeah. that would be would wonderful. Yeah. Thank Have you, a wonderful Jacqueline. holiday season, Jacqueline. Okay. You too. Alrighty. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.